All right, so another nice example we can work through to kind of see how all these uh, tools for analyzing autonomous differential equations work together would be to look at a continuous model of selection. So uh, early on in this class, we talked about a discrete time model for selection where we had uh, two populations, right, of different types of bacteria. One's like a mutant and one is a wild type bacteria. And so maybe one has some sort of survival advantage over the other. And we wanted to see, you know, in, you know, in a given petri dish, both of these populations are growing, but if one of them is growing faster, then we would say that it's going to overtake and kind of become the fraction one of the total population, right? So let's say we had two different types of bacteria, right? So we're going to do kind of the same sort of model, but with differential equations instead. So we have two different bacteria types. We have, let's say, mutants and wild types, okay? And let's say that the mutants, oops, mutants will be here, wild types. Let's say that the mutants are governed by dm dt equals mu times m, right? So they have some growth rate, mu. And the wild types, let's call them w, have growth rate lambda. Okay, so the growth rate the wild types is lambda, okay? And we wanna know, okay, which one is gonna kind of become the, the most populous of the two bacteria kinds, right? So we're interested in the total fraction, the population fraction maybe, population fraction of mutants, right? So we'll call that X, which would be M over W plus M, right? Number of mutants, divided by the total population. Total pop. Okay. And so what it turns out to be, I won't work through the details, but it turns out that this uh, differential equation for the mutant fraction looks like this. Mu minus gamma x times one minus x, the non-mutant fraction. Okay. And so this looks you know, almost completely different than the discrete time model of the same sort of idea, right? But this is our autonomous differential equation, right? The change in the number of mutants, right, is this number, mu minus gamma, mu minus lambda, sorry, times x, the number of mutants, times one minus x, the fraction of non-mutants, okay? And so let's analyze what happens in this situation, right? What happens to the mutant fraction? X. Well, before we kind of do more, let's look for equilibrium points, right? Let's look for equilibria. Equilibria. So we're looking for where dx dt, which is this function of x, equals zero, right? So we're looking for mu minus lambda times x star times one minus x star is equal to zero. So that happens in three situations, right? Basically when each of these factors is zero. So occurs when mu minus lambda equals zero, when x star equals zero, and when one minus x star equals zero, okay? And so what does this mean? This means that mu is equal to lambda. So the mutant and wild types grow at the same rate. So what that means in that case is that whatever fraction you start with, you always are gonna stay at that fraction. So the fraction X is constant. Right? because it's always going to grow at the same rate as the non-mutants. So the total fraction is going to be the same for all time. What does x star equals zero mean? All right, the second one. Equilibrium x star equals zero. That means no mutants, right? Only wild types. Okay? So in this situation, we'd think that that happens when maybe this population 
has a larger growth rate and it's you know in the long term there's just way more wild types than there are mutants and so there's essentially a fraction of zero mutants okay the other hand right one minus x star equals zero that gives us x star equals one so the fraction x star equals one means only mutants right the mutants have grown so much faster than the wild types that they've completely overtaken them in the fraction and they're the only thing left there's just so many more of them that they basically take up the entire population no wild types, right? So these are the kind of equilibrium outcomes. Either the growth rates are the same and every fraction will be kind of an equilibrium point, right? So this is kind of that weird borderline case where uh, we're not really thinking about equilibriums at this point because there just isn't any change in the system at all, no matter what. When X star is zero, that means that there are no mutants, there's only wild types. And when X star is one, at that equilibrium point means there's only mutants and no wild types, okay? So how do we understand the system or trajectories of the system, right? We want to think about the stability of these equilibrium points. All right, so if we just use the stability criterion, right, that says that F prime of X star so if we look at our function f, right, so f of x is this mu minus lambda x, one minus x. Let's factor this to make it a little easier. So this is some number, mu minus gamma, times one, sorry, x minus x squared. Okay, so if I look at the derivative of this, f prime of x, I get the same number, whatever that number is, Take the derivative of this function, that gives me a one minus two x. Okay, and so now we can look at the different stability of these equilibrium points, All right? So then for x star equals zero, f prime of zero is mu minus lambda one minus zero, which is equal to mu minus lambda, okay? So what that means is that f prime of zero, which is mu minus lambda, is bigger than zero if mu is bigger than lambda. And in this case, it's unstable, right? When that derivative is bigger than zero, that means that our equilibrium point is unstable, okay? And what does that mean? Mu is bigger than lambda means that the mutants grow faster than the wild types, right? Mutants grow faster. So this x star equals zero, which is the no mutants case, is unstable when the mutants grow faster. Because they even have a little bit of mutants, eventually they'll overtake the non-mutants or the wild types, right? So that's why it would be unstable. On the other hand, if mu is less than lambda, then wild types grow faster. So this no mutants equilibrium point is stable, right? And if mu is less than lambda, then that also means that f prime of zero, which is mu minus lambda will now be negative, which is in accordance with the stability criterion, right? So when the mutants are going slower, right? The wild types are going faster, then this no mutants case is the stable equilibrium point. When the mutants are going faster, this state becomes unstable. Right, for the same line of reasoning, if we look at the x star equals one, right, if I look at f prime at one, this is mu minus lambda times one minus two times one. This gives me a mu minus lambda times minus one, or lambda minus mu, right? So it's kind of the opposite stability, which makes sense. So that means that if lambda is bigger than mu, right, this would mean that when lambda is bigger than mu, this is when the wild types grow faster. If I look at the stability criterion here, I get f prime of one, which is lambda minus mu. Lambda is bigger than mu, so this is positive. Okay, which means it's an unstable equilibrium, 
right? Which makes sense. This is the only mutants equilibrium point. But if the wild types are faster, then this will be unstable, right? Because if I have any wild type bacteria, they're eventually going to overtake the mutants and become the dominant population. So the fraction would be uh, zero instead of one. Okay, so that's what makes this unstable. And then if lambda is less than mu, right, that means the mutants are faster. And if we look at our stability criterion, f prime of one is lambda minus mu is now negative, which means that this is a stable equilibrium. Okay, and this makes sense, right? If the only mutant's equilibrium point is the stable equilibrium point when the mutants are the dominant population, right? They grow faster, so they will always overtake the other population and become the fraction one. Okay, so this is all pretty consistent, right? So we wrote down this rule, and it's kind of consistent with what we would expect. Um, given what we are assuming about these two populations, right? So we could also look at the uh, phase line diagram or Euler's method, right? And so for that, I'm going to switch over to this other tool, this GeoGebra tool, right? So here on the right-hand side, I have the phase line diagram. So here I have this uh, dx dt is my mu minus gamma x one minus x, right, in blue. And then on right in orange, ignore this red thing for now. In orange, I have an Euler's method solution to the differential equation with some initial condition, right? So if we're considering the case where mu is bigger than gamma, right, we'll have a positive uh, constant right out here. So I just pick the constant two, right? So this was the case where mu was bigger than gamma. Sorry, mu was bigger than lambda. Right, so the mutants are growing faster. We expect that x star equals one, the only mutants case, will be the stable equilibrium, and the no mutants case will be an unstable equilibrium. Right, so if I look over at my phase line diagram, I have my two equilibrium points, one at zero, one at one. And if you think about this here, in the middle here, this is positive, right? So for x between zero and one, that fraction is going to increase away from zero and towards one. So one is indeed the stable equilibrium and zero is the unstable equilibrium. And if I look over here at this picture, right, if I start my solution with some initial condition between zero and one, you can see that uh, this is the time axis here. So if I start in between zero and one, I'm going to go towards the equilibrium at one, okay? And so this red line is just to kind of indicate what happens. Right, so if I am at some positive, um, if I am at some population level between zero and one, right, then the derivative of x with respect to time is positive. So this is increasing, and you can see that this trajectory is pointing towards that equilibrium point, right? And then if I was above it, right, which is kind of non-physical for this problem, but uh, we can display it anyways, right? If we are to the right of this equilibrium point, that derivative is negative, right? This blue function, which is our, our function or a derivative value for those x values is negative, which means we're going to decrease towards this equilibrium point, right? And so that's what this red trajectory here is showing. If I'm above my equilibrium point, I'm gonna point down. And then if I'm below this unstable equilibrium point, right, if I'm to the left of zero here, that derivative is negative and I'm gonna move away, right? I'm gonna keep decreasing away from this equilibrium point. So we're moving away from this here, right? So if I did the solution below zero, it would go off to negative infinity. But if I did it above fraction one, it's gonna come down to this fraction one because one is a stable equilibrium and zero is an unstable equilibrium, right? But if you notice, if I start the solution exactly at zero, then I'm going to stay at zero for all time, right? Because I have no mutants. The fraction mutants is zero. I can't get any mutants if I don't have any to start with. If I start exactly at one, then you're gonna stay there too. And if I start near one, I'm going to approach it. So that's the stable equilibrium. If I start near zero, I move away from it. So that's the unstable equilibrium, right? And so every time I'm moving this thing, it's kind of regenerating that Euler's method solution to this differential equation, which is nice. And so then what happens if I change this growth rate, right? So this was mu minus lambda. 
So when mu li minus lambda was positive, this is kind of the stability you saw. If I make mu minus lambda negative, right? So now I'm looking at uh, this case here. Mu is less than lambda. So this mu minus lambda is negative. Okay, All right, so I'm doing this case here where the wild types are growing faster. I expect that the no mutant fraction, right? Zero, x star equals zero, is the stable equilibrium and x star equals one is the unstable equilibrium. Oh, I did all that <laughs> without switching windows. I apologize, right? So when mu minus lambda is negative, I'm looking at this case here where the wild types are going faster and we expect that x star equals zero is the stable equilibrium, x star equals one where you only have mutants is unstable, okay? So let's switch back here and see what happens in this diagram, right? So over here on the right, <clears throat> again, we have the phase line diagram. So in blue is that update or, you know, that right-hand side function, or now I'm saying that mu minus lambda is minus two, okay? So it looks like a parabola that's pointing upwards. If you look between zero and one, what is the derivative? It's negative, which means that if you're between population zero and one, you're going to decrease towards population fraction zero, right? So if you look here, uh, ignore the red for now. If I start between zero and one, it's decreasing down to fraction zero, right? So that's the stable equilibrium in this system. If I start exactly at one, I'm going to stay at fraction one, right? If I don't have any wild types, I can't have those wild types take over the fraction. But if I even have a little bit of them, right, then my population fraction decreases. As if I start a little bit away from that, it's going to decrease down to zero eventually. As those wild types, which grow faster than the mutants, are going to quickly overtake it in that population fraction. Okay? And, you know, just for to finish this up, you know, if I start above one, it's not physical, but it's going to increase away from one. So if you look to the right of one here, it's positive. So that means that that value is going to keep increasing. And then there's no equilibrium point, so it's just going to go off to infinity. Same thing if I start uh, below zero, right? This to the left of zero here, right? This is all positive valued for that derivative, which means that the function is going to increase and it's going to increase until it gets to zero. Right? So if I start below zero, that fraction is going to increase until it reaches zero. And then it's going to stay there for all time because that's the stable equilibrium point. Okay. And so that's kind of uh, all the situations that can happen with this type of model. And you can see it's not much more complicated than the discrete time system that modeled the same thing. It's just kind of a different view, right? Now we're able to kind of say what's happening at every moment in time, whereas those discrete time models while they had a lot of the same equilibrium points and kind of stability criterions were slightly different, but you still had the sort of the same situation where whichever one grows faster will eventually dominate that population fraction. It's just a matter of uh, kind of the fidelity at which you can kind of see what these populations are doing. With a continuous time system like this, right? This is continuous time. We know basically the population level at every time point. Whereas in the discrete time model, even though it was basically the same thing and had basically the same conclusions, we don't really, or we can't really say what's happening in between our discrete sample points in the model. Okay. But, you know, hopefully this kind of connects it back to a dynamical system that we've seen before and kind of hopefully makes these autonomous differential equations seem a little less mysterious and more just like, oh, that's just a different way to model and view the same sort of mechanism and same sort of system.